Hi there, my name is Sao Shung. Today I'll be talking about how to perform a sigmoid colectomy. Here are the aims of the video. The target audience are post-exit fellows or advanced trainees who are hoping to learn how to perform a sigmoid colectomy or a high anterior resection independently. I hope to describe a specific approach to the sigmoid colectomy also known as a high anterior resection. This will be done with specific technical details so anybody can reproduce the steps and perform the procedure by themselves. The patient in question is a 60-year-old lady who presented with per rectal bleeding. Colonoscopy demonstrates a distal sigmoid tumour with the histological diagnosis as adenocarcinoma. This is a CT scan of the patient demonstrating the sigmoid tumour in relation to the upper pelvis and the surrounding bowel. The surgery was performed under general anesthesia. She was placed in a modified Lloyd Davies position, clean draped and catheterized. We first begin with abdominal entry and insertion of the ports. While most of us will end up with a preferred port placement, it is important to know the logic and the compromises behind the choice of ports. Target anatomy for a high anterior resection is the left eyelid fossa. This is where the primary dissection is around the tumour. The port should allow access to this with good triangulation. To this end, I would recommend that the optical port be placed in the periumbilical area. A 12mm port should be placed in the right eyelid fossa and 5mm ports in the right flank and in the left upper quadrant. This would allow not only the surgeon, but the camera and the assistant access to the target anatomy. Placement of the assistant 5mm port in the left upper quadrant also allows an experienced cameraman to manipulate the camera with his right hand and the assistant grasper with his left hand while standing to the surgeon's left. Next, we proceed to prepare the operative field. After the patient is placed in a modified Lloyd Davies position in a steep Trendelenburg position with all ports placed, the assistant is instructed to hold up the transverse colon by grasping its mesentery. Small bowel lying on the descending colon mesentery is gently swept to the patient's right upper quadrant. After this, the assistant should hold up the sigmoid colon by grasping the sigmoid mesentery. This will allow us to sweep the small bowel out of the right lower quadrant and pelvis. If the small bowel does not stay in place, I routinely position a piece of gauze to do so. This is placed in the gutter between the great vessels and the origin of the small bowel mesentery. The gauze is moistened to keep it in place. The right ureter can often be appreciated as it traverses the sacral promontory after the small bowel is positioned away. Our next step is medial mobilization of the IMA pedicle. In this step, the IMA is lifted away from the retroperitoneum. The assistant should be directed to lift the sigmoid mesentery upwards and cranially by grasping the sigmoid mesentery. The surgeon's left hand then holds the upper rectum upwards. This stretches the rectal sigmoid mesentery like a sheet above the sacral promontory. With the mesentery of the rectal sigmoid under tension, cut between the bony sacral promontory and an estimation of where the IMA would traverse. This is usually about 1 to 2 cm above the bony sacral promontory. If you are in the right place, air from the pneumoperitoneum will dissect into the incision, demonstrating the correct plane. When dissecting, cut superficially wide before dissecting deep to keep the anatomy in perspective. Identify the hypogastric nerves and cut above it. Dissecting this correct plane will lead you to totes fascia when you perform the sigmoid mesentery mobilization. As you dissect cranially, you will need to adjust your assistant. Reposition the assistant's grasp approximately, but direct him to retract in the same direction, which is to say upwards towards the abdominal wall and cranially. Again, cut wide by incising the peritoneum before tackling the actual plane between the nerves and the IMA pedicle proper. A combination of gentle blunt dissection and sharp dissection will not only allow for perfect delineation of the correct plane of incision, the hypogastric nerves will also be preserved. As we proceed cranially, the assistant may need to be adjusted one more time. Here we can identify the dorinum. We now know that we are near the root of the IMA. Cut wide by incising the peritoneum all along the surface of the IMA root before performing deeper dissection. Using the left hand to perform retraction, the nerves around the IMA root can be separated with a combination of blunt and sharp dissection. We can perform a bit more medial to lateral dissection here before dividing the IMA. Small, gentle sweeps are preferred to wide and coarse movements, and this will prevent tearing of small vessels, obscuring vision. If we are in the correct plane, 
the ureter is deep to the overlying retroperitoneal fascia, as you can see here. In patients that are more fat, insisting on visualizing the ureter will involve dissection through this fascia off-plane. I am generally satisfied by the intact retroperitoneal plane that I've preserved the ureter. Up to a certain point, dissection becomes hindered by the IMA, which is still tethered to the aorta. Recognizing that further attempts here results in diminishing returns, we now proceed to the step of vascular division. We now return to the root of the IMA. We have freed the hypogastric nerves away from the pedicle and are now clearing the tissue around the vessel. Skeletonizing vessels is a matter of cutting the tissue layer by layer carefully. The tunica adventitia is a bloodless plane and can be sought and carefully dissected to expose the IMA proper. This is done circumferentially, and when completed, the IMA is always thin enough for ligation with 5mm clips prior to division. Here, 5mm hemolock clips are placed proximally and distally, and the IMA is cut in between with an energy device. We now grasp the cut pedicle with our left hand and retract upwards. This gives perfect exposure of the correct plane and further development of this leads easily to the line of tot. Finding tot's fascia by this method is very reliable. You can also look at the vessels to give us a clue as to anatomical perspective here. Vessels in the colonic mesentery tend to be thicker and straighter. Vessels in the retroperitoneum tend to be thinner and curlier. The more lateral we proceed, the more obvious the line of tote is. After a certain point, difficulty with further progress indicates that the required limit of medial to lateral dissection is reached. Another clue as to how far we need to dissect is to take the lateral extent at the level of the bifurcation of the common iliac artery. Here we can view the anatomy, which is admittedly obscured by preservation of the plane over the retroperitoneal structures. We can appreciate the gonadal vessels, which is lateral most. The ureter here, is medial to it. The bifurcation of the common iliac artery can be appreciated here, which is at the transverse level of the sacral promontory and is also where the ureter crosses the iliac artery. Once the lateral extent of dissection reaches the bifurcation of the common iliac artery, medial to lateral dissection can stop. We will encounter more and more dense adhesions as we unnecessarily dissect the peritoneal lining from the lateral wall. At this stage, I chose to divide the IMV which is still intact. If the IMV is not parallel to the IMA at its root, it is further along the sigmoid mesentery and may be very near the left colic artery. The vessel is best approached with the assistant holding up the mesentery straight up and dissecting the fat around the vein circumferentially. The vein thus skeletonized can then be ligated. We will now complete the sigmoid mobilization. We flip the sigmoid over to the patient's right and by using the lateral wall as a fixed point of counter-traction, the surgeon can easily laterally mobilize the sigmoid. By retracting the sigmoid towards the surgeon, the path ahead for dissection is displayed clearly. Dissection should proceed as proximally as is required to perform a tension-free anastomosis. After freeing the descending colon, we now move our attention to the lateral attachments of the rectosigmoid and the upper rectum. After pulling the rectum straight out of the pelvis, the assistant is directed to provide counter-traction by retracting the opposite tissue towards himself. The surgeon also retracts towards himself, allowing dissection right in the center. There is a tendency to cut too medially. The trick is to follow the curve of the rectum. The correct line of dissection then becomes clear. The straight and direct path will result in leaving a small sliver of the lateral mesorectum behind. Getting the plane right here helps immeasurably with performing a TME. There are also nerves along the lateral wall which must be preserved. The ureter can also travel close to the dissection here, so be careful. As we go distally, again the tendency is to cut too medially, perhaps along this line. Counterintuitively, the line of dissection is more lateral. Again, the retraction is more effective if it is pulled towards the retractor rather than apart. Keep the mesorectum always in view. Once the left side of the upper rectum is sufficiently mobilized, go back to the right side. The assistant should hold the cut edge of the mesentery at the level of the sacral promontory and retract straight up and cranially. The surgeon's left hand holds the distal bowel and lifts it upwards. This allows for a perfect view of the right posterior upper rectal mesorectum. 
dissect to free the right lateral aspects. Once the dissection proceeds more medially, the left hand is more useful to provide fine retraction upwards with the flat aspect of the retractor. The principle is that the assistant provides the coarse retraction while the surgeon provides the fine retraction. Again, a combination of sharp and blunt dissection provides a synergistic way of proceeding here. Continually adjust the left hand to optimize retraction. At this point, we can proceed only up to the mid-rectum along the posterior plane, but this is more than enough for a sigmoid resection. Here, we can appreciate the left inferior hypogastric nerve which must be preserved by gentle dissection, freeing it away from the mesorectum. Sufficient mobilization of the upper rectum is necessary to allow for a tension-free anastomosis. I routinely extract the specimen through a fenestial incision and to do so the IMA pedicle must be sufficiently mobilized for extraction. The assistant first holds the sigmoid mesentery upwards. Using the left hand, the vascular pedicle is pulled to the right. This allows access to the sigmoid mesentery where it should be incised above and parallel to the IMV and IMA. We now prepare for the transection of the mesorectum. First, straighten the rectum by instructing the assistant to pull the rectum out of the pelvis. The tumour can now be assessed and a suitable distal transection point for an adequate distal margin should now be determined. The assistant and the surgeon now retracts to spread out the mesorectum, allowing division under ideal tension. The surgeon retracts cranially and downwards, while the assistant retracts cranially and towards him. This allows division of the mesorectum easily. Again, divide widely and superficially first by breaking the peritoneal layer both right laterally and inferiorly. Adjust the retraction accordingly to achieve maximal benefit. This will only need to be adjusted once or twice. The direction of retraction is the same throughout this phase of the operation. Now we can divide the fatty tissue within the mesorectum along one line of transection at areas of maximal tension. The superior rectal artery encountered at this level is near its inferior border and can generally be divided with an energy device without mechanical clips. Continue altering the extent and direction of tension to divide the mesorectum along a continuous perpendicular line of transection. It is generally easier to dissect as far as possible from the right before switching over to the left as our working pots are on the patient's right. When further progress reaches a state of diminishing returns, shift to the left side by swinging the bowel to the right. For thinner patients, most or all the work can be done from the right side, leaving almost nothing left to be done when we swing the bowel over. We now proceed to undertake the distal transection. The surgeon straightens the rectum by pulling it out of the pelvis. A linear cutting stapler is then placed perpendicular to the rectum. The rectum should now be irrigated to clean the area of transection internally. Close the stapler and hold it shut for about 30 seconds before firing. A fenestial incision is now made and the bowel is exteriorized. The proximal transection is performed with the help of a purse string device and the specimen is delivered. The colonic stump is cleansed and the anvil of the circular stapler is secured through a purse string suture. The bowel is then reduced into the abdomen and pneumoperitoneum is recreated. We now proceed to perform the anastomosis. The stapler is passed to the rectum transanally. It is sometimes useful to hold the rectum in place to help passage of the stapler, but this is not always necessary. Adjustments must sometimes be made to place the stapler in an ideal position for the spike to emerge right at the centre. This can either be immediately above, below or through the staple line. The stapler is docked, but before closing, the orientation is checked by sweeping the camera up along the lateral border of the sigmoid colon. After closing the stapler and waiting for about 30 seconds, the stapler is fired. Not shown here is the evaluation of the integrity of the anastomosis to an air leak test through the fenestial incision. The donuts should also be checked to ensure that they are satisfactorily intact. The anastomosis should lie tension-free with both limbs pink and healthy. 
I routinely place circumferential interrupted serosal stitches around the anastomosis through the fenestial incision as an added security. Some retrospective trials demonstrate a reduced leak rate with this technique. My patients undergo post-operative management under an enhanced recovery protocol and generally have minimal intravenous fluids with initiation of normal diet the next day. Patients can go home generally within 4 days after surgery if they are able to tolerate food, move their bowels and have satisfactory blood test results. I wish to thank my friends and colleagues without whom this video would not have been possible. This simple video is dedicated to my family who have supported me and to my fellows and associate consultants who have trained under me. Thank you for your time.